<laughs> you saw it, Shauna. You saw it first. <laughs> there so, so check the reflection off the wings on this one. You see how the reflection oh, is kind of cellophane-y? Yeah. You got a really bright reflection wow, off of it. That shows that it's very young. Okay. Oh, okay. Two or three days old. You have to look close to identify a dragonfly, and it helps to have an expert along to point out the distinctive details. They all have the stigma here, right? So it's at the node of the wing. That region is referred to as the node. It's got the four black spots, and that's a four-spotted skimmer. Chalk one up for the beginners. We have a hundred more dragonflies and dozens of damselflies yet to learn. This is the eastern fork tail. It's the only damselfly we have in North America that has a green thorax and a blue tip on its tail. Equipped with nets, field guides, and a sense of purpose, students fan out. They're attending one of Kurt's workshops and exercising their newly acquired identification skills. The first step is knowing what to look for. Dragonfly wings, when they're perched, are, are generally held horizontally. Damselfly wings are generally held up over their abdomen. Damselfly eyes are always separated. Dragonfly eyes are almost always together. And then it goes on from there. There's lots of other more subtle differences, but the long, skinny abdomen of the damselfly versus a more stout, broader abdomen of the dragonfly those are some of the differences. It really gets you out here and noticing everything. And you feel you're not alone anymore. You know that there's so much out here now. It's really exciting. I'm looking for movement for them flying. When it's cloudy, it's really hard to see them. When it's sunny, then the light reflects off their wings. Dragonflies are fierce predators and use those wings to hunt. Adults feed exclusively on live prey, almost always caught in flight. As a result, they can maintain an internal body temperature of up to 110 degrees. That's pretty amazing for a cold-blooded insect. They can fly backwards, forwards, up and down, hover in one spot, fly very fast, maneuver to catch insects, to be, avoid being eaten. Um, and in all that, there's a lot of muscle activity which generates heat. Kurt wrote the book on dragonflies literally to generate a new appreciation for these fascinating creatures. He lectures, presents workshops, and contributes to the DNR's Odonata survey project. Spots, definitely spots. He's fully aware that for most of us, a proper identification is tough. So concentrated time in the classroom completes the workshop. Which would make it a spike test. It's not all that terribly easy to get started. There's definitely a learning curve. Um, but people who apply themselves to it a little bit, they find that that, that learning curve plateaus out pretty quickly. And then, um, then the rest of it starts coming really, really easily. We just need to learn more about everything that's out there. So, And if it's not a good birding day, it's probably a good dragonfly day. Birders really get it. They know the little subtle eye ring on a warbler or a wing patch or something like that. That's kind of the level of identification we have going on with these guys. Except you can hold these in your hand um, and you don't have to look through binoculars at 60 yards to try and identify them. So in some ways it's easier. A lot of people think that identifying yeah. birds is hard, but yeah, if you can hear them and learn the songs, that's, that's pretty easy. These guys, you need a net, you need to chase them down <laughs> so, and have the field guide there. Uh, but again, they're in certain groups, and once you learn the main groups, you're, you're going to have a pretty good idea, and you can have them up close and take photos and identify them I'm not sure right I'm up sure. close. How you have good looks at them right there in hand. So You see how she's still brown. She's very, very young. She's only probably a day old. She'll turn blue, but the black patterns are visible on it. Now we're getting into hand lens territory. What I'm looking at is the, those claspers, those appendages at the tip of the abdomen. Resource specialists and interested citizens are in this workshop so they can learn to identify dragonflies and damselflies on their own. They'll be at the forefront of a push to learn which insects live where in the state. What we want to do is actually learn what species we have in the state, what habitats they're tied to, what we have in the different counties, because how can you know what you're losing or what's changing unless you know what's there to begin with? And right now we don't know. So far, dragonfly information in Minnesota is spotty at best. Kurtz worked his corner of northeastern Minnesota pretty hard and found 74 species in Lake County alone. 
but other counties have never been surveyed and have no records at all. And so with the pressures of uh, development, agriculture, forestry practices, um, and then the ultimate global climate change, as things start getting moved around, the ranges start to change. Right now we won't know that there's any change in Minnesota because we don't know what the ranges are. So a new frontier is open for those willing to take a closer look. They have an opportunity to post new county records across the state. Great thing for all of us to go out and see what we can do. We're hoping to document a whole lot more for all these different counties and have better range maps and better idea of, of another whole group of species that are found in Minnesota. Now it's not just, oh, there's a gnat or there's something. It's like, oh, that might be a dragonfly or a damselfly nobody's seen before. So real exciting. We're looking where people haven't been looking. And so what other mysteries and, and rarities are, are out there to find that we haven't found yet? And that's what really drives me is that, what am I going to find today? I'll be surprised if it's not a new county record. Oh, really? Really. Yeah. <laughs>